So it is the closest election in U.S. history between Democrat, current Vice President Kamala Harris and Republican former President Donald Trump. Less than 1% separates the two of them in the latest Real Clear polls that have come out. This is closer than what we've seen in the last three or four election cycles. In fact, if you have to see an election that is closer than this, you have to go all the way back 24 years to the year 2000 in the infamous Bush versus Gore election, which ultimately, of course, was decided in the Supreme Court. But let's try and make sense of this because there are very real world consequences for whoever becomes the next US president, not just domestically in the United States. India is watching this very closely. This is being watched right around the world from Beijing to Moscow to London because there are consequences for who becomes the next U.S. president. Let's try and make sense of this by speaking to someone who knows a thing or two about U.S. elections. He's been talking about it. He's been researching, writing about it for the better part of the last 40 years. Professor John Mearsheimer from the Political Science Department at the University of Chicago. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, and uh, good to see you uh, as we count down to the U.S. election. Good to see you. All right, let's start with, uh, you know, if you could explain to our viewers sitting here in India, because there's a lot of interest, uh, you know, in the U.S. election, who's going to win, who has the edge. First things first, why is this election so darn close? Well, you want to remember that the 2020 election uh, was close and the 2016 election was close as well. And I think that what you have here is a situation where the electorate is by and large split in half. Um, and when you look at the seven swing states that really matter, uh, it's almost impossible to tell who's ahead in each of those seven swing states. So predicting who's going to win this election is almost impossible. Do you reckon because it's such a close race and it boils down to, like you said, about half a dozen swing states, what actually matters is who's got better organizing on the ground, who turns out the vote more, who mobilizes better on the day and perhaps now because of early voting in the days leading up to? I think that matters, but it's not uh, apparent that either side has an advantage in that front. I mean, both sides understand full well that in a remarkably close election like this, you know, mobilizing your supporters and getting out the vote matters enormously. So both sides are hard at work on this front. Uh, I think they're doing, both sides are doing everything possible to, you know, uh, eke out a victory here. There's no question about that. The problem, though, for Harris is she seems to be sort of flattening out at around 49 percent. And Trump, uh, you know, the lead between Trump and Harris, let's say around the time of the, uh, the debate, which happened a, month, a little over a month ago, and right after that, Harris got a bump. Uh, she was leading by over 2%. Right now, it's less than 8%. She seems to not be the candidate who has momentum. Trump, on the other hand, seems to be the one who's got tailwind behind him. Would that be concerning if you're in the Harris campaign running up to Election Day, in the, re in the lead up to Election Day? Yes, I think so. But if Trump has a tailwind behind him, it's a tiny tailwind. Uh, I mean, it's not, uh, as far as the polls are concerned, propelling him ahead of her in any meaningful way. Uh, I was looking at a New York Times uh, poll uh, that covered the seven swing states, and they were a dead, in a dead tie in four of those states. And in two of the states, Trump had a tiny lead, uh, which I think was statistically insignificant. And then in one other uh, state, uh, Harris had a statistically insignificant lead. So if Trump has a tailwind, it's not doing that much for him. I think if you're going to make the case for Trump, that Trump is likely to win this, mm -hmm. uh, has to be the argument that uh, lots of people who do not respond to pollsters are Trump supporters who just are afraid to make it clear uh, that they're Trump supporters. And furthermore, a lot of people who respond to pollsters uh, and say they're undecided are really Trump supporters, but uh, they're afraid to say that. And one has the sense, it's just a sense, that there are a good number of people out there who are Trump supporters who the polls are not capturing. 
Uh, and many people believe that this is what happened in 2016 and what happened in 2020. If you want to remember, in both of those cases going into the election, it looked like Trump was in much worse shape than turned out to be the case after people went to the polling booth. And this is the argument that it's hard to say publicly in certain states and in certain quarters that you're a Trump supporter, even though once you get in the polling booth, you'll pull the uh, lever for him. So uh, I had Professor Lichtman on the show earlier this week uh, from, the, uh, from the American University. He's, of course, the man with the famous keys. Uh, he had an interesting take on this, the undercounting of the Trump vote. He said that was true in 2016 uh, because a lot of people did not want to be seen as you know, voting for Trump. Uh, he was an unknown commodity at that time. But he says it's less true of the 2020 election and more certainly of the 2024 election. Uh, he also had an interesting theory. He says just like the Republican vote was undercounted in 2016, he reckons the Democratic vote is going to be undercounted in 2024. And he says primarily that is women, women who are, A, not speaking to pollsters or women who are motivated enough because of the abortion uh, issue who are coming out and voting against Trump, who may have normally voted Republican, but are not voting for Trump this time because of that issue. Well, <clears throat> there's no question that there is a male-female divide here, and men uh, tend to be much more uh, supportive of Trump, and women tend to be much more supportive of Harris. There's no question that that, that is true. Uh, but uh, the issue here is whether the polls are missing that, and on Election Day, uh, we're going to see uh, results that don't mesh with what we see uh, in the polls now regarding men and women. And I don't think that's the case. I think the polls are pretty much capturing uh, the female-male divide at this point in time. The point I was making had to do with Trump supporters. I do believe that there are a good number of people out there who I interact with who are going to vote for Trump, but do not say that to me because uh, in the circles I move in, saying that you're a Trump supporter is not a smart thing to do. It's not politically correct. Uh, how do you square that with, again, conventional wisdom that much of Trump's base or his supporters are non-college educated white voters? Well, that's just clearly true. Uh, but Trump has lots of other constituencies that support him. For example, if you make a lot of money and you're not interested in paying taxes, you're going to vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you're deeply opposed to abortion, uh, even if you're wealthy, you're still going to vote for Trump. Uh, there are just a lot of different issues at play here. Think about Arab Americans and the mm -hmm. consequences of what's going on in Gaza. And here we're talking about the Gaza genocide. Uh, in the year 2020, Biden got, you know, 80 plus percent of the Arab American vote. Uh, if you look at polls today, uh, it looks like uh, Trump gets 45 percent and Harris gets 43 percent. Again, compare that with 80 percent of the Arab American vote for Biden uh, in uh, 2020. You want to remember that Biden won Michigan, which is a swing state uh, that has lots of Arab American voters in 2020. And uh, he may lose, uh, or she may lose, Harris may lose, and Trump may win uh, in Michigan because of that Arab American vote. I do want to talk about the, the immigrant vote or the, or the minority vote. Uh, here again, it's fascinating to me that whether it is among black American voters or Hispanic American voters, and these are constituencies which you would traditionally think are, are heavily uh, skewed in favor of the Democrats, uh, Trump, particularly with black men and with Hispanic men, uh, seems to be doing better than certainly what he did in 2020 or in 2016. Again, for someone who said famously that immigrants are eating cats and dogs, how does one explain that? Well, I think there's no question that among uh, black men there has been significant movement towards Trump, and you even see this among Hispanics. Uh, and the fact is that these people often feel that their interests are best represented by Trump and not by Harris. Uh, a lot of black men or a lot of Hispanics don't think that Harris, who is a liberal Democrat, has values and has uh, positions that represent what they believe in. 
and they're willing to, you know, look, uh, put aside his uh, views uh, on immigrants or his crude comments on immigrants and vote for him anyway, uh, because uh, he represents their interests. You also have a problem with the Democrats, that the Democrats tend uh, to talk down to people who are not well educated. And you saw this uh, with Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. Remember, Hillary Clinton said, it's hard to believe she was foolish enough to do this, that Trump supporters were despicables. Yeah. Uh, this is basically saying that half the body politic uh, are comprised of despicable people. And recently you saw this with Barack Obama when he was talking to black men and telling them that it appears that they have a problem voting for a black woman. And I, Barack Obama, will tell you what you should do. You should vote for this black woman, period, end of story. This caused a lot of controversy in the black community. And a lot of you know, black men were very resentful of Barack Obama for coming in and lecturing them. So you don't want to underestimate the extent to which uh, uneducated people uh, and people of other persuasions as well, people who are educated, greatly resent uh, the fact that the Democrats have a holier-than-thou approach sometimes, uh, and they talk to people as if they have truth, and those people who disagree with them uh, are, you know, foolish in the extreme. This causes problems for the Democrats and is not to be underestimated. When did that flip happen? I mean, it was, the Democrat Party was supposed to be the party of uh, the labor class and, you know, the unions and so on, and the Republicans were always the party of the rich. Now it seems to be inverted. Trump's base most certainly seems to be coming from poorer sections. Certainly a large part of his base seems to be coming from poorer sections of, of society, whether they are white or black or, or, or Hispanic. Yeah, there's no question about that. First of all, with regard to the South, uh, where you have lots of people who don't have uh, fancy educations. Uh, when I was young, the South was solidly democratic solidly democratic. And uh, then with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, uh, the South flipped. And now the South is red uh, and it's no longer blue. So that's one big part of the story. But the other thing is that starting in the Reagan years uh, and certainly picking up in the Clinton years, uh, the Democratic Party lost its ability to almost automatically attract the workers. Uh, the working class uh, it used to be again when I was young that people who were in labor unions, people in the working class, axiomatically voted Democratic. That began to shift under Reagan and certainly under Clinton because Clinton began to appeal to well educated people. Uh, and his interest in the working class was not as great as it had been previously under people like Truman uh, and people like FDR and so forth and so on. Okay. So the Republican Party began to lose workers. Uh, I mean, excuse me, the Democratic yeah. Party began to lose workers. I, I do want to come to a point where, you know, a lot of non-politically heavy uh, or politically engaged voters, you know, want to vote, vote for the person that they feel right, that they feel has, has, has character, right? Uh, especially for, for the most important job in the country. Uh, and, and here's where I'm curious to know, despite all the stuff that, that Trump has said, how is it that he's still polling such high numbers? I mean, just in the past week, 10 days, he's, he's talked about Arnold Palmer taking a shower. He's, he's said some pretty uncharitable things, like I said, about the immigrants eating cats and dogs. Does that not matter? I mean, is he like Mr. Teflon? Nothing sticks. It doesn't matter what he says. Or is it that they are far more resented by Kamala Harris on the other side that what he says doesn't really matter? Well, I think that... Uh Trump would probably win the election going away if he didn't say such foolish things. Uh, I think that it does hurt Trump. But what puzzles all of us is that despite the fact he says these crazy things, he's still slightly ahead of uh, Harris in a number of the swing states, and he looks like he might win the election. One says, how can this be the case? And I think the simple answer is that people overlook those foibles, uh, those crude tendencies that he has, 
And they say to themselves, he represents my interests. Uh, for example, if you don't want to pay high taxes and you think the Republicans are a party that's not going to raise taxes or even might lower taxes, you'll overlook his crude behavior and vote for him anyway. The same is true with issues like abortion. Uh, furthermore, you want to understand that some people actually kind of appreciate his crude behavior. People mm -hmm. argue by behaving in this manner, he is appealing to his base. Uh, and uh, I would imagine that there's some black men and some Hispanic men who see him as a real man because of the way he behaves. Uh, so it, it's a complicated issue. But my bottom line would be that if he did not behave in these crude ways, uh, that he would beat uh, he would beat Harris handling. I think he's I do think he's ultimately hurting himself. So l let me come to what the the implications or the the down the line fallout would be. Uh, if Trump becomes president or Harris becomes president, let's let's start with India. Uh, I know there is a a sort of bipartisan consensus on the Hill uh, when it comes to India, but uh, surely administrations and the personality of uh, of the occupant of the White House makes a difference. Uh, who do you reckon would be viewed more favorably uh, from New Delhi's point of view between Trump and Harris? I think probably it would be uh, Trump. Uh, because I think ideologically the Modi government is more in sync with Trump than with Harris. But I think regardless of who gets uh, elected in the United States, it will have little effect on U.S.-Indian relations. Uh, I don't see any evidence that the two candidates are interested in pursuing foreign policies that would lead them to have different approaches for dealing with New Delhi. Is it concerning what we've seen in the last few weeks and months about this Khalistani stuff? Uh, what we saw between India and Canada, of course, is, has really gone down the tube, uh, that relationship, that bilateral relationship. Even with the United States, this one case that has happened in New York, the opening of the charges and so on, uh, do, you, do you see that sort of casting a shadow on the overall relationship? A tiny shadow. I mean, the fact is the United States has a deep-seated interest uh, in making sure that it has good relations with India. Uh, I mean, India is in uh, a very nice position from its own point of view that it's not too close to the United States, but it's reasonably close. Uh, and that means the United States has to work hard to make sure that India stays as close as possible to the United States. So the Americans will go to great lengths not to alienate the Indians. Uh, it's a similar situation to the Saudis. Uh, the United States sometimes gets very angry at the Saudis and wants to play hardball with the Saudis, but it really can't because it has a deep-seated interest in having close relations with Saudi Arabia. And the same thing is true with India. When we look at China, when we look at Russia, and we look at U.S.-China and U.S.-Russia relations, uh, we have powerful incentives to have good relations with India, regardless of who's the president. So, so to that extent, the meetings this week in Kazan, uh, in Russia, the BRICS summit, Prime Minister Modi has met with the Russian president, uh, the Iranian president, also this big meeting between, with the Chinese president, especially after uh, an agreement was announced on the border between India and China earlier this week, uh, that they will now revert to the status quo as it existed in 2020, that border clash for the last four years. Uh, there is now seemingly a bit of respite there. Again, how would this be seen uh, in, in Washington? Well, this just tells Washington that it has to go to great lengths to make sure uh, that it maintains close relations uh, with the Modi government and the Modi government doesn't get too close to Putin. As you surely understand, and as all Indians surely understand, the United States is very nervous about India's relationship with Russia and even nervous about India getting too close to China. Uh, and in that case, the United States has a vested interest in going to great lengths uh, to woo uh, India towards Washington as much as possible. But the Modi government, and I believe any Indian government, is sophisticated enough to understand you don't want to get too close to Washington any more than you want to get too close to Moscow or to Beijing. All right, Professor John Mearsheimer. Uh, f final question. I mean, I, I don't know if you're a betting man, but if you are, uh, who would your bet be on, on Harris or on Trump? If I had to bet, I would bet on Trump. 
okay. my guess is, and it's just a guess, that Harris will win the popular vote. Uh, but in the seven swing states that really matter, Trump will eke out uh, a narrow victory. As I said before, I think it's likely that there are a number of people who are Trump supporters mm -hmm. who are not saying so. And I think they'll vote for him when the time comes, and that will put him uh, over the top. But my guess would be not by much. All right. Professor John Mearsheimer, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, sir. Thank you very much for joining us here on CNN News 18. You're more than welcome.